It's Palm Sunday. Traditionally, churches like ours celebrate what we sometimes refer to as the triumphal entry of Jesus moving into Jerusalem. It is a celebration because hosannas are sung, palm branches are waved, crowds are gathered, and yet there's something slightly askew. It's a celebration, as the title of today's sermon implies. It is a celebration slightly askew. Something's a little bit off. The crowd is excited, but Jesus is fairly somber. Jesus has an agenda. As you probably picked up already, the Gospel of Matthew is referring specifically and incorporating specifically the words of the prophet Zechariah. And Jesus is intentionally imitating what the prophet Zechariah intends. The scripture talks specifically about this new leader, the hope for Jerusalem and Judea and for all the people, will come into the holy city humble and riding on a donkey. Jesus intentionally imitates what Zechariah prophesies. So let's look a little more carefully at the background of what's going on here. What did Jesus have in mind? First of all, what was Zechariah's context and what was Zechariah hoping for? And then how is it that Jesus picks up specifically on Zechariah's uh, imagery and moves from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem, specifically imitating what Zechariah attempts to predict or prophesy? Well, let's give some background and remind ourselves where we were last week. We talked about this 37th chapter of Ezekiel and the historical context of what we know today as the exile, the Babylonian exile or the Babylonian captivity. It was a traumatic time, as we said in, in the sermon last week. The setting for that valley of dry bones bleached by the sun was a vision that God gave to Ezekiel that represented the people of Israel, the, the trauma that Judea had experienced. The people of Judah were in exile in Babylon because the armies of Nebuchadnezzar had ruined the temple, destroyed the temple, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and had taken the key leaders, like Ezekiel, into exile. So Ezekiel's imagery is stark, it's graphic, it's really indicative of the trauma that the people of Judea had experienced. Well, what Jesus now is picking up on is moving away from that exile experience and moving into and taking out of what we call the post-exilic time, or sometimes known as the Persian historical period. Now, this is going to sound a little more academic than maybe some of you are comfortable with, but let me just share how this works. Those that have been preparing for our Holy Land journey know these terms. And by the way, our Holy Land journey has been postponed until next year, next April. But in those preparation sessions, we've talked a lot about these historical periods. The Babylonian captivity took place in what we know as the Babylonian historical period or the Babylonian period. It's followed by what we know as the post-exilic period or the Persian historical period or just simply the Persian period. And this is a period that takes place following 539 BC. This is a very important date in the Old Testament because it's the time when the Persian king Cyrus the Great king of the Medes and the Persians, enters into the city of Babylon. And the Babylonian Empire falls, and the Persian Empire really begins. The reason this is important for our text today is the prophet Zechariah is preaching and teaching and hoping and giving the people hope during this time of post-exile. It's, in a way, a time that is remarkably similar in many dynamics to what we're experiencing today. And the responses for the Jewish people are very similar to the responses that we have in that there are a variety of ways of looking at and experiencing the time that you're in. 
And the Bible contains several different perspectives from this time period that are very important for us to understand. One of them is Zechariah, but there's also Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is written during this post-exilic period or the, the Persian period. Ecclesiastes is attempting to deal with a, a, a congregation or an audience that is not too unlike ours in that there are largely middle-class people who are trying to figure out how to deal with the new dynamics of what we today would call a global economy. That is, in the time of Koheleth, the author of Ecclesiastes, they were very much integrated into this broader Persian empire. Judea, or Judah, had been integrated into the Persian Empire. The people who'd been in exile in Babylon by Cyrus the Great, they'd been freed and allowed to return home if they chose. Some Jewish people chose to go back to Jerusalem. The problem was, though, during this period, Jerusalem still lie in ruin, was lying in ruins. The temple was still destroyed. Uh, it was a mess. And so there weren't a lot of people who wanted to go back. A lot of folks had just acclimated themselves to living in the metropolitan area of Babylon and beyond. And so what we find in the book of Ecclesiastes is Koheleth, that author, seems to be dealing with this very much dispersed population who had begun to integrate themselves into this global economy with all the difficulties and the excitement that go with that. One of the things that I've found interesting in Ecclesiastes in, in dealing with this global economy is that Koheleth at one point, I think it's in the eighth chapter, talks about uh, casting your bread upon the waters. Now, many of you have heard this saying before. It comes straight out of Ecclesiastes. And I, frankly, growing up, didn't really know exactly what that meant. It sounded even a little bit like uh, throwing bread out to a bunch of ducks on a pond, cast your bread upon the waters. But in fact, it is advice to people dealing with the global economy. It's basically saying, uh, use this global economy to your advantage, participate in international trade, send your grain across the waters to other nations and other peoples, and it will come back to you. Cast your bread upon the waters, and it will come back to you. That is, Share in the global economy, participate fully, and you'll benefit from that. Well, there are a lot of sayings like this in Ecclesiastes that, that are dealing with both the pressures, the stress, the tension, and the potential excitement and opportunity that goes with a global economy. Well, that may sound somewhat familiar to you because, of course, the same kind of stresses and strains are occurring in our global economy with us, with people we know, with small businesses and large businesses, with regular individuals trying to figure out how do you navigate this whole new world of a global economy. And in a global economy, strange things happen, uh, scary things happen, like what we're experiencing today with COVID-19. Well, there was also another response to this Persian period and the difficulties that people were experiencing, both the good and the bad. Job is another book of the Bible in the Old Testament that was composed during this post-exilic period. A lot of scholars conclude that, that Job, in fact, is a very sophisticated uh, look at and kind of a philosophical treatise, sort of like Ecclesiastes in a way, but, but more directed in poetry. In fact, it, many say it's ex exquisite Hebrew poetry uh, in, in Job, dealing with this question of what happened to us? How did we end up in exile? How did this bad thing happen that uh, traumatized our people? And it, was it punishment? Well, a lot of the prophets were saying this was punishment for bad behavior. Job is saying the opposite in a way. He's taking the friends of Job and he's saying through them, uh, this is the way God acts. God punishes people who have sinned. Job, you have, have had bad things happen in your life. You surely must be punished. And this is a result of your sin. Well, Job disagrees adamantly. 
And in the end, Job is proven correct that that's not the way God acts, that there is this broader mystery in life that we can't understand. One of the ways of coping with this post-exilic period was voices like Job, uh, philosophical voices like Ecclesiastes through Koheleth. There also was another response. How do you deal with the, the scary aspect of living in a global economy? Well, Ezra and Esther are two books in the Old Testament that also deal with this global economy and this fear of trying to figure out what do you do as a people? Uh, how do you hold together? And both in Esther and in Ezra in the Old Testament, there is this real tribal mentality of we've got to stick together. We've got to do the right thing. In fact, Esther takes place in a very similar time frame as Zechariah in that we're told during the time of, of Xerxes and then later uh, Darius, uh, the, the kings of Persia, uh, Esther is taking place and Zechariah is taking place. So both of them are dealing with very similar issues. Esther is, is very much uh, trying to navigate a very, very difficult situation that is multi-ethnic, that is multilingual, that is uh, both exciting and frightening. And of course, the conclusion that many of us stop with in Esther is that Esther says for such a time of, of, as this, I've been called. She steps forward. She offers courage and resiliency and, and reestablishes the safety and resiliency of the Jewish people. It continues on, though, and gets a little more difficult for us to interpret because her uncle Mordecai ends up doing some, some pretty, pretty nasty stuff. So Esther, in a way, becomes very much like Ezra, the other book in the Old Testament dealing with how do you hang together? How do you deal with a society that's frightening? Well, both Esther and Ezra uh, end up kind of coming down on this We've got to hold together. We've got to be a tribe. We've got to uh, only be ourselves. In fact, the word exclusive is often used to describe how Esther uh, or, or how Ezra and Esther both deal with this. We've got to be exclusive and, and only allow people like us to be a part of our system of thinking and believing. And then there's Jonah. Jonah also was probably composed during this Persian period, this post-exile period. And Jonah takes the opposite reaction. Jonah, if you read all the way to the end, it's less about being swallowed by a whale and Jonah the prophet discovering that the family of God is much bigger than he ever imagined. In, in fact, it even includes his enemies. The Assyrian people in Nineveh, the capital of this Assyrian empire that predated the Babylonian empire, it was in those days, just unheard of to think in terms of God including the enemy in the broader family of God. This is Jonah's overall message. So we have Ecclesiastes and Job, more philosophical explorations of what do you do? How do you live? What perspectives should we take? You have Esther and Ezra talking about and dealing with, we've got to maintain our exclusive uh, tribal identity. We've got to stick together and only be us and not let other people in. And then you've got Jonah saying, in fact, this is a bigger picture than we realize. God is bigger and more mysterious and more welcoming than we can possibly imagine. And then we have Zechariah. This is where Jesus really comes down. Jesus also refers to Jonah, and Jesus clearly from his actions, especially the Sermon on the Mount, embraces Jonah's philosophy, that is the, the philosophy espoused by the book of Jonah, and that is that, that God's love incorporates everyone, that we are to love people who aren't like us. We are to welcome people who aren't like us, to love our enemies, to love the alien. Uh, pulling out from these very important passages in Leviticus, in Deuteronomy, and in Jonah, and also in Zechariah. Jesus not only refers to Zechariah, but specifically imitates Zechariah in his triumphal entry on what we call Palm Sunday. Jesus enters into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, riding 
on a donkey. Exactly the imagery that Zechariah had pictured as the leader of the Jewish people, the Messiah coming to save the people and reclaim God's vision for who we are to be. So Jesus takes this imagery in a very specific way. And I'd like to talk now about a couple of steps we can take in imitation of Jesus' imitation of Zechariah. The first is simply understanding the the time we're living in and the the need to do as Jesus advocates, in fact, as Jesus does. And that is, Zechariah says, he entered into the city humble and riding on a donkey. Humility, then, is our catchword, the first step for us in dealing with where we're living today, what we're living through, the fear and the tendency in all of us to to withdraw, and we're all dealing with probably loneliness and isolation, and we're also, in some cases, wanting to blame somebody. We're frustrated. We wonder, how long is this going to last? And who's responsible for all this? Uh, the, the stance of humility is a very powerful one that Jesus illustrates in this Palm Sunday triumphal in, uh, uh, imagery and triumphal uh, entry into Jerusalem. Because it's less about triumphalism as it is about being humble, Uh, a stance that is vital in our world today, this perspective of humility in recognizing that I'm not better than anybody else, but also no one else is better than me. That is, we're all in this together. We're all equally susceptible to COVID-19. We also are equally responsible for caring for one another because we all are equally important in the eyes of God. This is the real stance of humility, the real lesson that I believe Jesus is conveying in entering into the city humble and riding on a donkey, specifically capturing the imagery of Zechariah in this post-exilic period. The second one is moving from humility to determination. Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. The disciples tried to talk him out of it. But Jesus knew this was the right and important thing to do. David Brooks, in his great latest book called The Second Mountain, talks about the real difficulty that we're having in our world today. This is pre-COVID-19 that Brooks was right again, but in a way describing our society as hyper-individualistic, hyper-concerned about freedom for me alone, And in taking that hyper-individualistic stance, we lose the perspective of the real value of community and being together. There is a tendency, just like with Ezra and Esther, to stumble into tribalism and make it all about just the people who are just like me. When in fact, with both the stance of humility and the stance of determination, Jesus on this Palm Sunday experience, this movement into Jerusalem, is determined to make a broader statement. This is not just about one group of people. This is about all groups of people. The cross, as we've said before, is a leveling place. The ground at the foot of the cross is always level. It is a stance of humility. It is a stance of determination. Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. Jesus was determined to enter into that city and, as Paul so uh, aptly described on Wednesday, it was an entry into Jerusalem in Matthew to go directly to the temple and cleanse the temple and express deep frustration that the, the keepers of the temple and the workers in the temple had completely misunderstood and moved away from Jeremiah's vision that God wants this place, this holy sacred spot, to be a house of prayer for all people. This is Jesus' determined nature of reclaiming that vision of God, that together we share our lives as a, as a place of prayer, a house of prayer, a, a place of well-being for all people. It is a stance of humility. It is a stance of a determined spirit to understand more deeply and to prepare more broadly the kingdom 
of God through Jesus. As we had been preparing for this sacred Holy Week, beginning with Palm Sunday, in Fresh Start, we had uh, made preparations, and I want to thank uh, Shelley Woodruff and Kristen Coger for their leadership in providing what we had initiated early on in Fresh Start, and that was taking uh, little pieces of paper that were uh, like puzzle pieces, and we had invited during the Fresh Start service for both children and adults to color those pieces of paper. And it turns out what we had planned on Palm Sunday and during Holy Week was to take those pieces of paper and put them together in what would have been essentially stained glass windows in a way, imitation stained glass windows, windows that would have been made by all different people from all different walks of life pieced together. And then those stained glass, imitation stained glass windows were going to represent the stations of the cross. And during Holy Week, we were going to invite people to visit those stations of the cross and pray and meditate and attempt to reclaim Jesus' vision for us in both humility and determination. Also, in our sanctuary service, Catherine and I had, had planned what we thought was going to be a glorious uh, choir special that, that would have led us into the uh, experience of Palm Sunday with this title, A Celebration Slightly Askew, because the choir special was this glorious piece, but it had woven into the chorus a very interesting dissonance that felt like something wasn't quite right. It was a celebration, yes, but it also was something else you couldn't quite put your finger on. You just could tell there were some minor dissonant notes that were mixed in, and it was mysterious. It was sacred. It was leading us into something that we didn't quite understand, and it felt like the perfect lead-in to Holy Week and moving us in the direction of what happens with Jesus. He not only moves into Jerusalem on a donkey, in a profound stance of humility, with a spirit of determination to reopen the temple and recast God's beautiful vision as a house of prayer for all people everywhere. It also had a sense of dissonance to it because Jesus knew where he was headed. Jesus knew where this was going to lead. It was what we call the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows and suffering that Jesus begins to move through for you and for me. Brothers and sisters, as we prepare our hearts and our minds and our spirits for this Holy Week, we may, may we take seriously what Jesus hopes and dreams for us, for the people of Jerusalem, for the people of our day, that we reclaim the vision of Zechariah, that we reuse Jesus' very important stance of humility, of a determined spirit seeking for deeper and broader meaning in your life and my life. Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus knows what he's doing for you and for me and this Via Dolorosa the way of sorrows, the way of suffering for us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Down the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem that day The soldiers tried to clear a narrow street But the crowds pressed in to see The man condemned to die on Calvary was bleeding from a beating, there were stripes upon his back, and he wore a crown of thorns upon his head, 
And he bore with every step The scorn of those who cried out for his death On the Via Dolorosa Called the way of suffering Like a lamb came the Messiah Christ the King But he chose to walk that road out of his love for you and me on the Via Dolorosa all the way to Calvary Yeah.